Hi, and welcome back to the Wandering Westland. This is Chaplain Greg, and uh, boy, it's good to be here. If uh, you are liking these videos, please uh, like and subscribe on YouTube. Um, that way, uh, I'll uh, be able to get this content out to more folks, and uh, I'd appreciate it very much. So we're continuing in our Walking in the Word series, and we're going to be going through the letters of Paul. Um, the Apostle Paul we met uh, last week in Acts, and uh, he is a very interesting fellow. Um, so Paul was from Tarsus. Where, where is Tarsus? Tarsus, and we learn this in Acts 21, verse 39. Um, Tarsus is at the southern end of Turkey. Um, it was on a highway that led down to Egypt. It was part of a highway system that the Romans had developed. And so it was a very multicultural city that Paul was raised in. Um, he was raised a Jew, and he was not just raised an ordinary Jew, but a very orthodox, conservative Jew. Um, being from Tarsus, though, he learned Greek and Hebrew, because he was a Jew, Aramaic, because that was the common language that was spoke amongst uh, Jews in Israel. And uh, he probably knew a little Latin as well, because he was a Roman citizen. And so... Um, hanging out with Romans, you need to learn a little Latin. Um, he was obviously looking at his writings It was and his speeches and acts. He was trained in philosophy and rhetoric, and these were two really important subjects uh, to the ancient world. Um, philosophy means that you understand the, the old philosophers and what they taught and what they thought about, and then rhetoric is how to communicate that. So uh, he was raised a Roman citizen from birth. And what this means is that someone in his family somewhere acquired citizenship, and he, he was, it was passed on to him. He was schooled as a Pharisee. Um, so that means that he went to Jerusalem at some point, uh, applied under another Pharisee to learn Pharisaical uh, rules, regulations, teachings, and that sort of thing, and became a, a Pharisee. It was Gamaliel that we learn in, in later in Acts was his uh, teacher. And so he was, he was a disciple of uh, the Pharisaical rule. He had an encounter with Jesus, though. After, after persecuting uh, the Jesus followers, he had an encounter with Jesus, and we, we saw that in Acts chapter 9. Um, and in that encounter with Jesus in, in Acts chapter 9 and, and the chapters following, we see that he is designated to be a emissary, an apostle, uh, an evangelist to not the Jews, but the Gentiles. Uh, that's kind of odd for a man who is a Pharisee, who is somebody who's so steeped in the law and the traditions. But because God placed him in Tarsus because God directed his training. Um, he was the ideal person to go to the Gentiles and teach them about this new faith, this faith of Jesus. Paul was uniquely qualified to bring the gospel to the Gentiles because he moved in both the Greek Gentile culture, but also he could speak and talk with Jews in a language that they understood. And I don't mean Hebrew, I mean the cultural language. He was able to talk about Torah. He was able to talk about uh, the prophets and the writings in such a way that Jews could resonate with what he was saying. 1 Corinthians 4, 6 demonstrates this uniquely. So the Jewish highest value is light. We've learned that from our study of the Old Testament. Light is the presence of God. For Greeks, the highest value is knowledge. So knowing things in uh, philosophy and uh, history and that sort of thing to the Greeks is, was very important. And then to the Romans, their highest value was glory, uh, the glory of conquering and the glory of uh, uh, being the Roman Empire. And in 1 Corinthians 4, 6, we see Paul put all of these concepts together when he says, For God who said, let the light shine in the darkness, there's your light, has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge 
of God's glory in the face of Jesus Christ. So what he's saying is that all of these cultures, Jewish, Greek, Roman, come together in Jesus Christ. This isn't just a Jewish faith. This is a faith for the entire world. Goes back to the promise that God gave to Abraham, that his family, someone in his family, Jesus, would be the savior of the world. So Paul wrote a lot of letters and many, much of the New Testament is consisting of Paul's letters. And these letters were to three different audiences. So the first audience was the churches. And most of the letters are to churches that he founded. The book, the letter to the Colossians, he didn't found that church. And as far as we know, he never visited Colossae, but he wrote a letter to them nonetheless. Um, so those are, those are letters that are instruction, correction. In the case of the Galatians, there's a lot of correction. It's, he's kind of cranky in that letter. Um, but they're letters of love to these churches. And then there's letters to individuals. So Timothy, Titus, and Philemon. Those three letters are to individuals. In fact, we think the, the letter to Philemon was was carried along with the letter to the Colossians. And so these are these are important people in Paul's life and their letters to um, to encourage them, instruct them, and in Philemon's case, ask a big favor. So let's go through these real quick. Romans, um, it was written about 56 AD and he and Paul was in Corinth when he wrote it. Uh, 1 Corinthians, written just before Romans, while well, Paul was in Ephesus. And when you are reading through Acts and you're cataloging um, Paul's missionary journeys, pay special attention to the cities that he stops in, because he's doing some writing in these cities. So uh, 1 Corinthians, written just before Romans in Ephesus. 2 Corinthians, probably written just after he wrote to the Romans, and that was also in Ephesus. Galatians, um, this is one of the earlier books, probably not as er earlier as the Thessalonians books, uh, letters, but <clears throat> that was written about uh, 54 AD when uh, Paul was in Macedonia. Ephesians, that was written in Rome uh, while he was in prison, and uh, that was in 64 AD. Philippians, Colossians, also written while Paul was in prison in Rome uh, between 60 and 61 AD. That brings us to Colossians. Uh, sorry, Colossians was uh, written from prison in 60 to 61. First and Second Thessalonians. Okay, so these are really early letters written from Corinth, probably around 50 A.D. <clears throat> then First and Second Timothy. So these are the last letters that Paul wrote. And um, there's something special about reading Second Timothy because Paul realizes he's about to end his journey on this earth. He, he, he is getting the sense that uh, the emperor is going to end his life and he's going to be martyred for the faith. These were written about 64 AD. Titus was also written about that same time. Doesn't have the same emotional drama that Second Timothy has, but uh, it, it, you could tell that Paul is writing to a beloved friend of his and colleague. And then Philemon, was written from prison probably with Colossians um, between 60 and 61 AD when uh, Paul was in Rome. Uh, this is a favor that, Phil that he's asking Philemon because uh, he has, uh, Paul has a uh, colleague named Onesimus who is actually a runaway servant or slave of Philemon. And uh, Paul is asking Philemon, hey, take it easy on him. He did you wrong. You, you, he knows that he did you wrong, but he's a follower of mine. You're, a, he's a follower of Jesus. He's a, he's a helper to me, and so take it easy on him. It, it, it's a really interesting little letter. It's one. It's one chapter. It's not you know. It's, there isn't even chapter breaks. It's just verses. So those are the letters that Paul wrote, and they're immensely important for our developing of theology, for our developing of the Christian faith. Um, 
some people say that uh, that Paul and the Gospels sort of contradict each other. They don't. They complement each other. Um, they go together. You cannot have the letters of Paul without the Gospels, and you can't really fully understand the Gospels without the letters of Paul. So they're they go together. They're very complementary. All right, some of the themes that are in Paul. First theme is the multi-ethnic church. This is huge. This is something that Paul talks about a lot in his letters. Um, he was dealing with many different cultures, so not just Greek or Gentile people and uh, Jewish people, he was dealing with Macedonian Gentiles, Macedonian Jews, Greek Jews, Greek Gentiles, Roman Gentiles, Roman Jews. So he had to be really flexible in how he communicated to people. Um, the multi-ethnic church is such an important part of what he writes about Ephesians especially Romans you can't understand Romans without understanding the history behind Romans you see uh, the Jews had been kicked out of Rome and that included included the Jewish believers in Jesus and so what was left in the Christian church was Gentile believers and that was for a number of years and then the Jews returned including the Jewish believers back to Rome and the church had changed. And so the Jewish believers and the Gentile believers were having a tough time getting along. And that's what Romans is about. It's about how these two groups of people can come together under one faith. Romans reads a lot like a sermon. And Galatians, Galatians is, is definitely steeped in this multi-ethnic theme. Um, Galatians written before Romans, some people call Galatians Romans Jr. because a lot of the themes that Paul hits on and expands in Romans is started in Galatians. You can see that Paul is starting to formulate the language that he, he wants to talk about these issues. Um, Galatians is a tough read because, it, not tough in that it's complicated, it's tough because he's angry at the Galatians for turning into a form of Christianity that is very legalistic in nature, that involves obeying laws as a way to gain Christ's salvation, which is exactly the opposite of why Jesus came. Jesus came to set us free, not to enslave us. And uh, these people he called Judaizers were coming into the Galatian church and corrupting the gospel in the Galatian church. So the multi-ethnic church, really important. Um, a second theme that we have here is this theme of the language of patronage. So what is patronage? Um, patronage was a vital part of the ancient Mediterranean culture. Um, it was important to both Jews and to Gentiles. It was so ingrained into this culture that they really didn't have a lot of specific words to describe it because it was just there. It was a part of you know, how they lived, how they operated. Um, there are two words um, that are important when it comes to the idea of patronage. The first is a Greek word, charis, which means gift or grace. Um, it's used to describe the giver, the gift, or the recipient's um, gratitude towards receiving a gift. Charis. The other one is pestos, which means trust, loyalty, faith. So how do these two ideas work? And these are two words that Paul uses in all of his letters, and they're really important. So a patron would take someone on as a client, as an assistant. So that would be charis. It'd be a gift that he gave them. The client would then return with trust, faith, loyalty, pistos, and show charis, that is a gratitude to the person who is taking them on. 
The patron was always in a position of power and privilege over the client, and the client was subordinate to the patron. The patron had something the client could not get on his own. So think of an apprenticeship kind of thing. Um, those who have apprenticed in, in electricity, you apply to be an apprentice. You're given the caress of coming on as an apprentice under a master electrician. That master electrician teaches you as a gift. Well, sometimes it costs money, but teaches you how to be how to be an electrician. And then you show them pistas, trust, faith, loyalty, by studying and learning and being grateful for what you learn. This is exemplified in Ephesians 2, um, verses 8 through 9. And this says, For you are saved by grace through faith, charis through pistos, and this is not from yourselves, it is from God's gift. So Paul takes this idea of patronage, and he takes great pains in all of his letters to distinguish this difference between faith, which is trust, which is dedication and loyalty, to works. God presents us with the gift, charis, of salvation, which we can't achieve on our own. We respond to that gift with what? Pistos, faith, lifetime loyalty, trust. <clears throat> so let me use an example of a sweater. And this was a sweater that I bought for my wife for Christmas. And it was a beautiful red cashmere sweater. Now, when I bought that sweater, before I bought it, that sweater belonged to the store. When I bought that sweater, was it mine? No, it was a gift. It was a gift I was going to give to Carrie. Carrie was going to receive that gift on Christmas. That sweater was Carrie's. As soon as I bought it, I paid my money in order to buy a sweater for her. What could she do with that sweater? Well, she could receive that gift with gratitude and put it on and wear it. She could say, I don't like cashmere. Forget it. Or she could say, uh, that's a nice sweater. Put it in the drawer and walk away. You see how Karis works? It's a gift. And we got to do something with it. The other theme that is important in, in Paul's writings is election and the church. And we need to understand what Paul meant by the elect. Uh, it's essential. The Jewish understanding of election or predestination would never apply to an individual person or a group. It would apply to, I mean, it would, it would never apply to an individual person. It would only apply to a group. The Jewish people were chosen people, elected, predestined to be the people God used to bring salvation to the world. An individual can be a part of that elected group but the individual themselves aren't elected and uh, what I will do is I will put a uh, video next week all about this uh, because uh, I, I did a sermon on this uh, a number of years ago during COVID that it gets into real depth about this so I won't go too much deeper but suffice it to say election does not mean an individual, and I'm, I, with all apologies, sort of, to my Reformed Calvinist friends, um, they're wrong in this. And if you've, if you've watched my video on um, my theological distinctives, you know I am not a Reformed uh, person. I am Wesleyan uh, by nature. That's the title of my web channel. Um, so anyway... The last thing I want to talk about is Paul's use of literary styles of the period. So, uh, there are creeds throughout Paul's writing. So, let me read Romans 1, 3, and 4. 
Concerning his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who was the descendant of David, according to the flesh, it was appointed to be the powerful son of God, according to the spirit of holiness, by the resurrection of the dead. Through him, I'm going to go on to verse 5, through him we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith for the sake of his name among the Gentiles. Now this is Paul adding something in, including you who are also called by Jesus Christ. It is thought that that is an ancient creed. And you can also find creeds in 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 8, very important one, Philippians 2, 5 through 11. Paul also uses hyperbole. Uh, what do we mean by hyperbole? So let's go to Galatians. And uh, we're going to go to uh, Galatians 3, 1 through 6. You foolish Galatians, who has cast a spell on you, before whose eyes Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified? I only want to learn this from you. Did you receive the Spirit by works of the law or by believing what you heard? Are you so foolish after beginning by the Spirit, are you now finishing by the flesh? And then going on to verse 4, did you experience so much for nothing? If in fact it was for nothing, then does God give you the Spirit and work miracles among you by your doing works of the law? Or is it by believing what you heard, just like Abraham, who believed in God and was credited to him as righteousness? So you see this idea of hyperbole. He's blowing things up. He makes things bigger. It's, it, it, sometimes he, he becomes absurd in order to point out the absurd. And he's doing that in Galatians there. So hyperbole is an important. And then lastly, his use of interlocution. Oh, that's a big word. What, what is interlocution? Well, it means speaking in the voice of another person. So Romans 7, 7 through 24, that's lengthy, so I'm not going to read it here. Please go and read it for yourself. He speaks from the point of view of somebody who hasn't come to faith in Jesus Christ. So some people have read that and think, oh, well, Paul struggled with sin. Isn't that comforting that <clears throat> reading, you know, Romans 7, 7 through 24, Paul must have really struggled with this sin. No, he's not talking about that. Because in Romans 6, and then in Romans 8, he talks very clearly about how he has been set free from sin. He's no longer a slave to sin. But in chapter 7, verses 7 through 24, he speaks from the point of view of a person who has not fully given themselves to Jesus Christ. And then he returns to that voice in verse 25, thanking God that he has been saved and that he's no longer a slave to sin. So that's our friend Apostle Paul. Um, his letters are important. They're vitally important to our Christian faith. Um, and so I will put the uh, sermon up next week having to do with Ephesians 1 and the idea of uh, election and predestination from a Wesleyan point of view. Um, if you disagree with it, I'd love to hear your comments. I'd love to uh, read your thoughts about that. Um, but until then, this is Chaplain Greg with The Wandering Wesleyan. If you enjoy this content, please uh, like and subscribe. And uh, we'll talk next week. God bless.